Hello, everyone. This is Ed Denzel, host of Unfound. I wonder if you will consider becoming a supporter of this YouTube channel. By pressing the join button below, you can receive, for just 10 cents a day, the video version of the podcast a day early. The Unfound Now episodes a week early. Daily video updates from yours truly. And cool emojis to use during the Monday night live show. Please consider it as you watch the following spectacular video. Thanks. Have you signed up for Unfound's other podcast, Unfound Live, yet? Thank you. Natasha Alex Carter and Susan Carter were a daughter and mother, respectively, from Beckley, West Virginia. Susan had another older daughter, and Natasha was 10 years old. Sometime in February 2000, Susan's husband of three years claimed Susan and Natasha left with a man named Jose or Manuel. They were never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. There are two types of disappearances that Unfound has not prominently covered over the past six years. Cases in which sex trafficking is overtly obvious and a parent and child who went missing due to some type of custody battle. Why is that? My best guess is because I shy away from child disappearances for reasons I've detailed many times since I first came to this microphone. For sex trafficking, we've come close. Jesse Foster, certainly. And there's thinking out there that Allie Lowitzer was sex trafficked, and possibly Tiffany Daniels, and Leanne Hosberg. We can't forget Mark Heimbaugh could be in this category as well. Likewise, Dub Wackerhagen and his son Chance disappeared, and a woman was murdered under circumstances that are certainly not clear. But the facts say it's a stretch that both went missing for any reason having to do with Dub wanting total control of his son. Well, with Susan and Natasha Carter, the details are sketchy. And on the surface, this sounds like a the man said type of disappearance. But could this actually be a first? And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Linez's website, charlieproject.org. Susan Carter met the father of Natasha, Rick, in the mid-1980s. Their daughter was born in 1990. But there were problems in the relationship. Susan had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but would not take her medication regularly. She eventually was caught on multiple occasions in the company of other men. The final straw was when Susan began a relationship with the couple's landlord, Larry Webb. The two got married in 1998, and through Larry's connections, Susan was able to get custody despite her problems. So, in February 2000, everything came to a head as Rick began to get leverage in the custody battle. During that month, Rick called Larry's house to find out where Natasha slash Alex, his daughter, was. Larry claimed that Susan and the daughter had left with a man named Jose and they would be back. Days later, Rick called again. This time, Larry said the two left with a man named Manuel. Yes, the name of the man had changed. They were never seen again. Due to Susan's personal connections to prominent people in the community, law enforcement could not be trusted in the investigation. This fell to the West Virginia State Police 
and eventually the FBI to figure out what happened. They were unsuccessful, as Larry kept to his original story, eventually divorcing Susan due to abandonment in 2003. Unfound has visited this part of West Virginia before, with the disappearance of Brian Cook. Surprisingly or not, some of the same prominent people with auras of suspicion come up in each case, despite the disappearances not being alike in any way. Please keep that in mind as you try to answer these three questions during the interview. Number one. Why did law enforcement inject themselves into the custody arrangements without proper authorization? Number two, if Larry were telling the truth, why did he not seem more concerned about where his wife and stepdaughter were? And number three, how could Susan have been declared deceased in either 2000 or 2003, but there are still no whereabouts for Natasha. Natasha's biological family believes that foul play occurred for both her and her mother. The guest for this episode is Natasha's father and Susan's ex-boyfriend, Rick Lafferty. Unfound News. Another unusual week here at Unfound. Two weeks ago, it was presentations. A week ago, it was a hurricane. This week, it's disc golf with me attending the United States Disc Golf Championships from October 5th until October 10th. Meaning, I may not be as responsive as I usually am to your comments and emails. But I will be doing some work on this trip. Next, the October Unfound newsletter is now out. If you are on the list, you got it. If not, please email me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. It's of course a good one with me getting up on my soapbox regarding media responsibility. Finally, the unusual days will be continuing for me because in less than two weeks, on October 18th, I'll be flying to Colorado to take part in the Steve Pankey trial. I'll be returning on the 20th. Where you can find Unfound. On these following podcast platforms. Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and many others. Especially outside the United States. The new podcast, Unfound Live, which comes out on Tuesdays, can also be found on these platforms. Social media sites, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the newest one, TikTok. Listener support sites, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. The website, theunfoundpodcast.com. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. And please mention Unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. A note before the interview starts. Rick refers to his daughter as Alex throughout the interview. Whereas I alternate between Alex and Natasha due to official documentation listing her as Natasha. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the father of Natasha Carter and the ex-boyfriend of Susan Carter, who is also Natasha's mother, Rick Lafferty. Rick, welcome to Unfound. Well, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, the listeners should know, uh, we, uh, Rick and I were just talking about this before we started this recording. Rick and I have known each other, although we've not met each other in person, but he and I have been talking about Natasha and Susan's uh, disappearances since maybe 2017, 2018. Uh, but we we're finally able to get back in touch with each other due to recent events that are going on in West Virginia regarding 
the investigation of Natasha and Susan. So, Rick, it's finally a pleasure to have you on. I know it's been a long time coming. It uh, certainly has. <laughs> okay. Let's just start here. Uh, let's just talk about your family in, in general. Of course, we're going to get into Susan and Natasha here in a bit. But uh, I know uh, calling you a couple times, uh, of course, that maybe you live with family members. Uh, do you have any other kids? Are your parents still alive? What can you say about your family in general? All right. I have a 16-year-old daughter, uh, Emma. Uh, and uh, my mother, uh, Shirley day uh i let her adopt her for uh for medical reasons you wow. know and uh wow. my mother is 90 years old uh, <laughs> this month and wow. and i live here and I take care of both of them well good for you rick fantastic and you live in west virginia where these disappearances occurred yes sir do you live in beckley or where where, where do you live these days no, I live about 35 miles south of Beckley in a little town called Glen Fork. Okay, very West. good. Okay, so uh, just so everybody knows that he does live in the area. And so you have another uh, child, Emma, who's 16. And uh, I know you've told, about, uh, told me about going shopping with her recently. And so does she live with you? Does she live with her mother? What's the status there with her? She lives with me and awesome. my mother. Great. Fantastic. Okay, so that is your family uh, here in 2022. And we're doing this interview on October 1st of 2022. Let's first talk about Susan, uh, who is, uh, we've decided we're going to call her your ex-girlfriend. You two are never married. She, though, is Natasha's uh, mother, and they are both missing. But let's talk a little bit about her. How did you meet her? What do you remember about her personality? Of course, this disappearance is over 20 years ago. What do you think the listeners need to know about Susan and her life and your uh, relationship with her? Uh, she was a mess. <laughs> she was uh, diagnosed uh, paranoid, schizophrenic, uh, manic, depressive, uh, bipolar type 1. Wow. Wow. And so I have to ask, Rick, how did you end up being with her with those issues? Was this uh, what was going on there? How did you become attracted to her? What, did she change over time or, or what happened? Well, I mean, she was, you know, physically, uh, you know. Okay. She was, I was attracted physically to okay. her. And I'd been driving a tractor trailer over the road, you know, mm -hmm. from coast to coast. And, uh, just one day, you know, I, I met her and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things progressed from there. Okay. D is she originally from West Virginia or is she from somewhere else? She was born in Virginia. Okay. And uh, she uh, then married this fellow, Ronnie Carter, and they moved to uh, Ohio. And then they divorced and she moved back here. And then uh, into the apartments, low-income apartments in uh, Oceana is where I met her. Wow. And the listeners might remember that Oceana, West Virginia, came up in a different disappearance that we've covered a couple years ago. Brian Cook, who uh, right. is still missing. And I know, Rick, you know about that disappearance. In fact, I remember talking to you about uh, Brian years ago when we first started talking. So this is all this uh, right. kind of same area. And I know Beckley, West Virginia... Virginia because I go through there every time I drive between Florida and Pennsylvania. Um, when did you, if you can remember, we don't need the exact month or anything, but what year did you meet uh, Susan? Uh, I would say it was probably in 1985. About 85, okay. And did she have any other, of course we know eventually you and she had Natasha, but did she have any other children from any other relationships? Yeah, she had a, a daughter, uh, uh, Chastity, with mm -hmm. Ronnie Carter, her okay. ex-husband. Okay. And when you two... They had... Please. I'm sorry. Please continue. They had her while they were married. Okay. And when you and Susan became an item, did uh, Chastity live with uh, you, or did she stay with uh, her father? She stayed with uh, Susan and I. Oh, she did. Okay, so you got to know uh, Chastity 
as well. All right, and how long, uh, of course, at the time of Susan and Natasha's disappearance in 2000, you two were not an item anymore. How long did that uh, relationship continue uh, before uh, it broke up and you, you two went your separate ways? How long did that take? Uh, it took 10 years. Wow. I mean, it was off and on, and you know, I don't know if you know anything about bipolarism, but I, do. I mean, you know, she just absolutely had four or five different personalities, you oh, know. Goodness. One minute it would be run hot, and next minute she would run cold, and you just never knew who you were talking to. Right. Right. The, uh, during your time with her, once again, I don't think you'd know anything before or after, but during your time, did she ever try to get help? Did you try to get her help? Was she open to that? What can you say? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Took her to a psychologist, psychiatrist. Uh, um, she was under a, a psychiatrist's care, and but she wouldn't take her medication. She said it made her feel funny. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. Yep. Um, and you... you I always tell when she stopped taking it, you know. Yeah, okay. And uh, for the listeners, and I know many of the audience, have, um, maybe some of them have suffered from what we're talking about here, know people. We know that a lot of them don't like to take their medication because, as Rick said, it, it makes does make them feel different than they're, they're used to feeling, and um, they think that they can go without it. It's been a, a topic on Unfound before. Okay, did she have, uh, given that she had this issue, did... You were a truck driver. Did she have a job, or were you mainly the breadwinner, or could she manage a, a working with these con this condition, or, or what did she do? No, uh, she was on uh, Social Security uh, Disability, SSI. Okay. Okay. But so I was the breadwinner of, you know, I mm. just helped support her and uh, mm. whatever Alex needed, you know, or the family. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So originally it was you, Susan, and her daughter from her previous marriage, Chastity. So now we want to talk about Natasha, uh, who is Susan and your biological daughter. And she was 10 years old at the time of her disappearance in 2000. Um, when she came along, what was that like? Uh, being a father and then, of course, her mother's having these issues. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, basically, I took care of the child. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I was both mother and father to the child because Susan, uh, she was rather promiscuous and uh, mm -hmm. would uh, she would sneak out while I was at work, and she had boyfriends, you know, mm -hmm. and, and have people. There was a guy who told me I'd go out the front door, and uh, this guy would come in the back. Okay. And I'd, uh, I would go to work, and, you know, and mm -hmm. I'd come home and, and, you know, I caught her once, but I mean, you know, that's neither here nor there, but, mm -hmm. but you know, she was just promiscuous. She was just, she was just, okay. I hate to say it, but ho. Okay. I gotcha. What, uh, then, once again, we, so you have Natasha, she, uh, once again, is 10 years old. Uh, when uh, she went missing. So she was roughly around, I guess, five years old when you and Susan finally broke up. What was the, the final straw for you? I mean, maybe maybe Susan broke it up. Uh, what was the final straw that you two finally, you know, went your separate ways? Well, uh, I was renting a, a house off this fellow named Larry Webb, and I moved into it alone, and... Uh, uh, I came uh, down to see Alex one day from school, and there's a, a car parked in the driveway of the trailer that I was paying for mm -hmm. that I didn't recognize, and it had temporary tags on it. And I asked Susan, I said, whose car is that? And she said, well, that's mine. I said, well, where did you get a car? She said, Larry bought it for me. I said, Larry? Larry Webb? She yeah. said, yeah. yeah. I'm seeing Larry now. So, wow. you know, that that's how I found out about that. The guy I was renting the house off of was 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 seeing Susan behind my back. All right, so your your landlord was one of the guys that Susan was seeing. Yeah, and eventually married. 
Right, we're going to get into that in a moment. We should know that uh, Larry is quite a bit older than you and Susan, right? Like 20 years older. That's right. 20 years or, yeah. or more older. Okay. And so that was the final straw for you? Pretty yes. Much. Okay. Yes. So how did you, being that you two, we want to make clear for the, everybody that you and Susan were not married, how did it... Um, custody arrangements then get worked out at that point. Of course, we know that she has these problems. You also have this other daughter. Maybe we need to mention what happened to Chastity during this time as well. Um, what went on when you you finally had had enough of her regarding uh, Natasha and Chastity? All right. Well, Chastity was, you know, her and her mother were, you know, on one side of the fence, and Alex and I were on the other. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, Susan and Mary, after they, you know, they left, Susan asked me if I could watch Alex for while they went to Florida, which they went on a, like a weekly basis. Well, they went this time and stayed for about three weeks. And I kept Alex, you know, and... Uh, mm -hmm. When she came back, Alex didn't want to go back with her, and Susan had these long fingernails, and she said she was going with me. And she got a hold of Alex's face and was trying to drag her out the door, and her fingernails cut into Alex's neck. Mm -hmm. And that's when I just, uh, I flipped out. I told her I'd beat her death, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but just straight straight as we could go to the magistrate and I got a temporary emergency order giving me uh, temporary custody for safety's sake, you know. Right, right. You know, until, until a hearing could be uh, arranged. Right. And maybe I should state right at this moment, of course, you're, uh, I'm using the name Natasha, but you go, you call your daughter Natasha Alex. That's what you called her. Yeah, okay. Alex. Alex, okay. Well, well, I guess that's interchangeable from now on. Okay, and I will remember that. All right, so what happened after you filed this um, injunction uh, for this? Uh, of course, this, I guess, would have been around 1995. What what came of that? All right, well, we had a hearing, and uh, they, were, they were gone. So we had an ex parte hearing, you know, where they, you know, we had it without her. And the judge granted me uh, temporary custody through the Department of Health and Human Services, which they they were on my side. They testified for me and everything else. And we had numerous court hearings. I had at least five different attorneys on this. One of them, David Thompson, uh, he quit right in the middle of our case because he said that he had gotten a job as a prosecutor. So then I had to go get another attorney. Wow. You know, yeah. and I mean, you know, it was super expensive and right. with the uh, with the uh, investigators and the attorneys and all that, you know, it was just, it was just, it was horrible. Yeah. It was horrible. I bet. And so then my, to understand then during this time that Susan and Nat, Natasha slash Alex were living with Larry and not with you? No, uh, Alex was living with me at that time. Okay. And I, I put her in school in, at mm -hmm. Pineville Elementary. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were still having hearings in court and all that, you know, and uh, until, uh, you know, uh, the, the family not lawmaster just never would set up for a hearing, you know. So mm -hmm. one day I went to pick her. Alex uh, from school and the sheriff was there with two or three deputies and and the school was letting out and I was there to pick Alex up from school which I did every day you know mm. and they uh, Randall Amos you know was a close personal friend of Susan's he was the sheriff and he came over there and he said Rick I don't want any trouble I said any trouble for, for, for what what would mm. I want any trouble with you for mm. he said well the court has ruled and they ruled against you which was a lie and uh he, then, you know, I couldn't do anything because all the children were, you know, coming mm -hmm. out of school and they mm -hmm. were sort of, you know, just running to and fro. And he had called Susan to come down there and pick Alex up and he gave Alex to Susan and Larry right there in the park.
parking lot. Well, you know, he told me to go home, not even, he said, and, you know, there's a no contact order with this. Well, I didn't look at the paperwork, you know. As a matter of fact, he didn't give me any paperwork on that day. Okay. But the, the paperwork we eventually got, it was, it was not an order for him to give custody to Susan. It was a or it was a order for the family and lawmasters, Susan McGraw, to hear the case ASAP. Mm-hmm. It, it was, you know, it wasn't. It was no kind of order at all. It was just telling her to hear the case. So and what? And when, when? When did this happen? What year? What month? Maybe you even remember to the day. What? What month and year did this happen? Well, I would say it was in June of uh, two thousand. June of 2000, all right. So uh, it was in January of 2000 Jan- because I, uh, I have a, a, a statement from uh, from Linda Phillips, the mm-hmm. secretary at the school, mm-hmm. describing how Alex was when they came and got her. Okay, so January of 2000, uh, so this is the, the, the year that then these disappearances happened. So in your opinion, the way you look back on it now, and we'll talk about the sheriff in more in depth a little later, they did this with no cause. They just kind of showed up and did this maybe because Susan wanted them to? Right, yeah. Yeah, they were personal friends. Okay. I've heard, you know, more than personal friends, but I mean, you know, that's that's a rumor. But. Okay. So after this happened that day, of course, like you said, you didn't want to make a scene, but, you know, you I guess you kind of thought, you know, my ex-girlfriend Susan, I mean, she has bipolar disorder. She's not a fit mother. I'm guessing you probably thought that eventually you were going to win this, right? Right. Yeah. I, you know, I was going to let the law take its course, you right. know, because I knew I was in the right. So I trusted the system. Okay. So uh, what, what happened it. then um, from January, and I don't know if we want to go up to the disappearance, but uh, disappearances dates right now, but January, February, March, you're still trying to work in the courts to get this all straightened out? Yeah. Yes, sir. And they were uh, trying to formulate a parenting plan for, mm-hmm. for both of us mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, uh, they had, uh, you know how they did the... Uh, just uh, they had a parenting plan, and they had uh, a mediator uh, to uh, to you know supervise the thing uh, mm-hmm. overall. And as a matter of fact, that's where uh, Susan really went off was uh, in Oak Hill. We went up there for a mediation meeting, and she came in there, and I mean, she was blistering hot. I don't know what mm-hmm. was wrong with her. She was in one of those moods. And that's the day she told me I would never see Alex again. I would just mm-hmm. laughed, a smirking laugh, you know. Okay. So, so then I, I have to ask, once again, I have no experience in this area uh, because I have no kids, but I do know custody battles and things like this can be very, very uh, traumatic and very rough. A lot of anger and things come out. In your opinion, the way you look back at it now, why couldn't the court or whoever see that Susan was not a fit mother? In your opinion, why why were you having so many problems? You're the guy with the job. You're the guy who has a family in the area. You're a good family man and everything. She's the one who has, you know, we have, we're very, you know, it's very sad she had these problems, but certainly not a fit mother. What do you believe the problem was that that you weren't getting uh-huh. your way? Because she was close personal friends with the sheriff of Wyoming County, and uh, then she knew the judge, John Harco, and mm-hmm. I do believe that John Harco just didn't know that uh, Suzanne McGraw had not uh, scheduled that for a hearing mm-hmm. because uh, we heard later on that he had called Suzanne McGraw and, and, and really bawled her out for, not, for letting that linger for so mm-hmm. long. And not hearing it, mm-hmm. and when I finally mean, did come come up. Uh, uh, her attorney Stanley Seldon showed up, and I told my attorney uh, Tom Esposito, I said, uh, just have her have him to, to uh, produce the child, my child, mm-hmm. and that's when uh, Stan Seldon uh, p- petitioned the court right then and there to be taken off the uh, off the. Uh, list as her attorney. He wanted to be removed wow. because he knew that 
was gone. He said that, that he didn't know where she was. Okay. So it, once again, looking back at it now, maybe you were caught up in the in the heat of the moment. Maybe you know because you're going through all of this. Twenty two years later, you know what was Suzanne McGraw? What was the delay? What was going on there? Well, she just overlooked it. She put me on the bottom of the pile and just. You know, she just didn't think there was any, any, you know, uh, any great rush in it. You know, mm -hmm. she didn't realize the seriousness of what she was dealing with. Okay. And, uh, you know, and uh, I've heard, you know, since then that, that other other horror stories from that family in law court, you know, where they don't take it seriously, especially when the man is involved, you know. Mm -hmm. And the man wants custody. And even the judge, the circuit judge, said that it was very unusual for a man to to love his daughter like I love mine. Okay. So, okay. you know. And we do know, um, maybe this has maybe changed since 20-some years ago, but we do know that women usually do get primary custody, I guess we might call it but it, it um maybe that's uh, has changed since then at least a little bit but uh so in this time once again after this day that the sheriff shows up uh alex slash natasha is supposed to go with larry and susan and not with you did she did uh alex continue to show up for school did you get to see her uh in, you know in no. february march nothing no. nothing Susan put her in school at the Hollywood School in Raleigh County, where she got into a superheated argument with the teachers up there, and then mm -hmm. she took Alex out of school up there, and then after mm -hmm. that, shortly after that, that's when they disappeared. Okay. All right. So once again, after that, just to be clear, and I, I just want to make sure the audience understands this, the day that you went to pick uh, Alex up, your daughter... And she was taken away by Susan and Larry, and the, with the sheriff's help, you were never in the presence of your daughter again. Well, no, I saw her. I took her pets to her. Okay. She had a. She had a. Uh, it's not a mink. It's a, a ferret. Yes. She had ferret. two two little house dogs. Okay. And when I took the pets to her, uh, she had the sheriff's daughter with her. And Larry. Wow. And, uh, you know, and her and the sheriff's daughter were playmates. You know, they, wow. uh, her name is uh, Demi okay. Alice. And, uh, you know, they were, Demi would come down to our house and play, and Alice would go up to their house and play. And, and you know, it was just everything was, was good, you know. Okay. But you couldn't see, Until, your, you couldn't see your daughter as much as you wanted. No, no. He told me there was a no contact order, oh and then you know I wasn't supposed to see her for uh, I think he said six weeks. Well, I waited then like two weeks, mm -hmm. and I couldn't stand it anymore. So I called up there, mm -hmm. and I asked Larry, you know, where Alex was, and he mm -hmm. said, "Well, her mother took her." Said so I said her mother took her. And and he said, yeah, they left with a Mexican fellow named Jose. I said, are you kidding? What are you talking about? You know? Mm -hmm. And I thought about it a while, and I waited about four or five days, and I called back, and I said, Larry, where in the world is Alex at? He said, I told you they left with this Mexican guy named Manuel. I thought, well, so you know, amazing. there's two different names right there. Okay, we're gonna and we'll we'll get into that in a moment because already I'm sure the listeners are like, well, that doesn't quite sound right. But I think uh, so. We have all these custody battles going on. It certainly sounds to me like you got screwed over, and obviously we've known you. You're not some guest who I just got to know. You know, I've been talking to you over the last month. I've been talking to you for four years, five years. And this has been the same story that Rick has told me, that the listeners should know since day one. I think Rick is very level-headed. He certainly does not seem to have the issues that his ex-girlfriend Susan did. And so, all in all, it's hard to understand why you, Rick, did not get custody of your daughter. Instead, Susan did. Um, what happened uh, to Chastity? Where was Chastity during this time that you're, you were battling over uh, Alex slash Natasha? Uh, she stayed with her mother. 
See, we had a trailer in Glen Fork, uh, where I live now, but it was up the road there a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I was making the payments on that trailer, you know, until I found out, you know, that Larry was making payments on it too, so to mm -hmm. speak. Right. And she had, the, she had the nerve to ask me if I was going to keep paying for that trailer. I said, are you crazy? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's Larry Webb's trailer now, as far as I'm concerned. Right. Right. Let's, but, you know, being, uh, that, being that we've mentioned him so much, I think it's about time we talk a little bit about Larry Webb. And we're just going to talk about, about factual terms. The listeners should understand that uh, there, and Rick knows them because Rick and I have talked about them, but... A lot of rumors out there about Larry Webb that we simply cannot get into because there's just really no paperwork to back it up. But factually, Rick, um, how, tell the listeners a little bit about Larry Webb. Of course, he was your landlord. So how did you even run into him in the first place? Did you know him before you became his renter? Um, you know, you can talk about where he worked, uh, of course, but what can you say about Larry Webb? Well, yeah, I met him because he had a house at McGraw's, West Virginia, about, about a mile and about, about a mile away from my college, and uh, I was looking for a place because you know, uh, at that time I didn't know that the, him and uh, Susan were going to see each other. Of but the, you know, there was a one of those things on the door, so I just took a chance and uh, uh, called this fellow. Mm -hmm. and asked him if he'd be interested in, in renting that house. And he said, well, yes, you know. He said that he would rent it for $375 a month. Okay. I thought, well, that, that's a pretty good deal, you know. Two-story house, brick, uh, so two-car garage. So I think that what happened was is when he, you know, after I started renting it, that he had called the house looking for me and him and mm. Susan just kind of started talking mm. and hit it off you know yeah <laughs> and, and once again a, he's he's like 25 years older than both of you yeah something like yeah. that yeah okay well, uh what uh so in uh Larry ever been married did Larry have any kids um what was his job what can you say about all those things what did you learn about him while you were renting from him uh, all right, his wife named Belle Webb, and she was uh, supposedly the first uh, successful kidney transplant in the United States. There's a newspaper article wow. about her. Oh, yeah. and, okay. And uh, I don't, as far as children, I don't know, but he was uh, married before to another woman. Her mm -hmm. name was Anne Bland, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, I've never gotten to talk to Ann, but she divorced him, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary worked for the Social Security Administration in Bluefield as a data entry uh, guy. Okay. Which, by the way, uh, Susan's uh, uh, Social Security uh, file says that she's been deceased since 2003 and and uh, uh, you know I always thought that you had to have a death certificate right. to enter when it's deceased in the in that that computer okay we're gonna we'll, I mean, we're it, gonna get into that too much more in depth but just for now Larry Webb so he lives there uh he's your landlord would you say before you found out that he and Susan were get together do would you say that you and Larry had a good relationship was he a good landlord yeah. Yes, yes. I even helped him move when uh, when he when the house sold. This mm -hmm. fellow named uh, Matthew Shook and I uh, drove the U-Haul and moved mm -hmm. his furniture from that house to the house at one cent twenty six Kyle Lane mm -hmm. and moved him. You know, wow. and that just shortly before you know I found out what was going on. Right, right. All right, so he's a much older man, married a couple times, uh, working for the Social Admin Social Security Administration, which seems like a pretty good job to me, um, and, and he has this house. You're running from him, at least the beginning. You think he's a good guy, and then you start finding out about these things. Then, of course, he infuses himself into this custody issue that you were having with Susan. Uh, when did Larry and Susan get married? Uh, 
Well, I would say it was probably, it was in the 90, probably 99, 98 or 99. 99. He bought her a, uh, a Mustang, uh, a yellow, bright yellow Mustang convertible, huh. which she she was screwing around with uh, with him in that car because she was seen uh, by my mother with uh, with this fella buying flowers, you know, with the top down on it, you know. Mm-hmm. She just didn't try to hide anything. Okay, is it? I, I guess but, what you're saying is even after she married Larry, was Susan seeing other guys? Yeah, she was. She saw this fella named uh, Ed Whitley, which was mm. who was murdered. Yeah. Uh, he was a doctor from uh, Yager, West Virginia, and uh, mm. he was murdered uh, uh, while Susan was seeing him. So I don't know. Right. You can put two and two together there. So I don't know. Okay. I don't know. If and I will. Mary I will- had I will post something about that. Uh, not, not sure it has anything to do with the disappearances, but uh, I will post an article about uh, what happened to him so the listeners can see what uh, you're talking about. So they're married, and I'm guessing you did you. I'm guessing you stopped renting from Larry and you moved somewhere else, Rick. Yes, I moved to Pineville, West Virginia, in an apartment over top of Davis Auto Parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, about three houses down from the sheriff, as a matter of fact. That's where Alex and, uh, and Demia got to know each other. Demia is a year younger than Alex, and they would play in the pool and ride bicycles and, mm-hmm. and whatnot there in the, in the street, you know, where I could watch them. Right. Uh, right. Okay, so we have all this. Uh, Larry, much older guy, decides to get married to Susan despite her having the issues that Rick has talked about. Uh, she gets custody of Alex and all of this seemingly underhandedly and wasn't really necessarily according to the law. There's something going on there. Uh, her other daughter, Chastity, is living somewhere else. And uh, so we have this big mess that is going on in the year 2000 between you and Susan, and Larry, and and all of this. Just one big mess. But through all of it, though, Rick, you really believed in the end that you would eventually get custody of your daughter. Right, okay. right. Uh, when we went to court, uh, you know, when uh, Stan Seldon, her attorney, uh, quit, mm-hmm. then uh, the family law buster awarded me full custody with no visitation or anything for Susan. Wow. You know, should she ever appear, mm-hmm. which she she never no, did, so. and of course Alex didn't either. Okay, let's move on to this, and you kind of uh, already talked about it a little bit, but we're going to go a little deeper into this. When did you realize that something wasn't right? Maybe you didn't care much about Susan, but something regarding your daughter, once again, uh, using either the name Natasha or Alex, um, when did you realize something wasn't right? You talked about calling Larry and then him telling you this story. Let's, let's go. Was that when you realized something was wrong? Right. When he was using different names mm-hmm. of who she was supposed to have ran off with, I knew Alex wouldn't leave with anybody without calling me, you know, yeah. because uh, our, our relationship was tight, you know. Yeah, yeah. And she, she didn't like her mother. Mm-hmm. I hated the way she was and her drug use and mm-hmm. her drinking and partying and dubbing and you know, it's just just mm-hmm. horrible, horrible okay. woman. All right, so when uh, approximately once again I realize this is twenty two years ago, but maybe you remember it to the day. When did you call Larry and when did he tell you about Susan and Alex going off with these one of these guys? When was that? Uh, that was just uh, like two weeks after they uh, after they were missing, it must have been up in like the first of February, up in that that time frame. So you called Larry in February two thousand, and that's when he told you that Alex and Susan weren't there; they left with some guy. Yeah, that's what he yeah. that's what a he Mex- told you. A Mexican guy, first mm-hmm. named Jose, mm-hmm. and then the next time I called, he was Manuel. Okay. At the time, when he told you that, I, I have to ask, so I realize hindsight 2020, but at the time in 2000, did you believe Larry? No, no. He's a pathological liar. 
Okay. I mean, I, I knew that when I first met him. Okay. I mean, it was a, a braggart, and and he would just tell okay. outlandish stories, and okay. and just that was just pathological. Even though you helped him move. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, I was trying to stay on his good side. I'm sure. I mean, my landlord. Yeah, I, I know the feeling. I, I've had a couple of landlords in my life too. And yes, I totally agree. You have to stay on their good sides. So what eventually, did you do something about it? Did somebody else notice that something wasn't right? Did like the school where, you know, Alex was supposed to be going get involved first? When was it that somebody really, you know, said, you know what? We haven't seen Susan and Alex for a while. Where are they? What, you know, how long did that take? Well, I started making posters immediately, and mm. missing child posters, and I put them up everywhere. I mean, stapled mm. them on telephone poles, put them in store windows, mm-hmm. and, and uh, I come to find it out, uh, this guy came and he said, did you know that uh, Steve Trent, a deputy sheriff, he said, did you know when you put up a poster, he's got a rake, and he comes behind you and rakes those posters off those telephone poles. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that kind of got on me. Of course. And I saw over there having a, a little party over there at the Fox's Pizzeria in East Pineville, and I just pulled in there, and I walked right in the middle of them, and I said, Randall, I said, Where, why, are you, why is Steve Trent tearing my missing child posters down? He said, because she's not missing. I said, well, if she's not missing, where is she? He said, well, she's with her mother. I said, well, where's her mother? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, if they're not missing, you know, they're, they're somewhere. Yeah. And uh, I, I said, you know, if Steve had better not tear another one of my missing child posters down, you know, and yeah. I kind of threatened him there a bit. But uh, then Steve Trent passed away. You know, mm-hmm. and he he had just had one leg. He got hurt really bad in a car accident. Mm-hmm. But you know, he he was the one tearing my posters down. He was raking them down with a rake, and he and I asked him about it, and he told me that Randall told him to do that. Okay, and Randall is the sheriff. Yes. Okay, and the, the sheriff the, the, that was friends with Susan. Exactly. Okay. Um, after you called Larry these couple times, and of course he, he said that one time she ran off with Manuel, another time she ran with Jose, uh, at any point in you, once again, in your opinion, none of us were there, but just you and Larry, at any point did he sound concerned that Susan and Natasha didn't come back? No, as a matter of fact, he uh, filed for divorce. Uh, he did? Yes, he, he uh, published in the paper three times, you know, mm-hmm. which is uh, the way you do it legally yeah. in West Virginia. You publish in a, a, a local paper three times, mm-hmm. and he divorced her on abandonment, uh, for abandonment. Okay. And then Chastity and her dad move in with Larry, and she has four children while she lives there. One of which turned out to be Larry's, and the others turned out to be someone else's. All right, so what you're saying is that, I have to ask you how you know that. How do you know that one of those, so what you're saying is Chastity ended up having a child with Larry Webb? Yes. So Susan's daughter Chastity from her marriage ended up having sex with Larry Webb, who would have been 50 years older, and had a child with him. Yeah. How do you know? How do you know? Rick, I got to ask, how do you know that? Well, because, of, you know, that's what I was told by people who know. Okay. That uh, she had DNA. Uh, Larry finally had DNA ran on them. See, she lost all four of the children because mm-hmm. of her drug use. They're mm-hmm. in the system now, and uh, they live with other people, mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, all right, you know, so I, I, I just want to make sure the uh, I just want to make sure the audience understands this. So Susan and Alex go missing. They're living with Larry. Somehow they go missing, and we'll get deeper into that. But then some point later, despite Susan and Alex going missing, Susan's other daughter moves in with Larry. 
Exactly. Oh my gosh. That is and her father. And and uh, Chastity's father. Right. Who would have been Susan's ex husband. Exactly. Wow, that is crazy. Uh, no. I think I don't know if you've ever. I, I maybe we talked about this. This is not was not in my notes. That is crazy, Rick. I agree with you. Okay, so this is all happening. It, once again, I realize you're not following these people around necessarily. But when would you say that Chastity and her father moved in with Larry? How soon after Susan and Alex went missing? Just as soon as the divorce came final. Chastity moved in. Okay, and when do you think that divorce came final, as best as you can tell? I would say it would be 2000, she went missing 2000, probably 2001, 2000, early 2002. Okay. All and, right, uh, so, we have, so we have that going on. You talked about this yellow Mustang. Uh, was the, as far as you could tell, was the yellow Mustang around or was it missing too, being that he bought it specifically for Susan? Well, he told the police that, uh, that uh, she took it with her. Well, come find it out, it was in his garage, and he, uh, the FBI later determined that he had sold it to his uh, great niece in mm -hmm. North Carolina, and they did a forensic, someone said that there was blood in it, but, mm -hmm. so they did a forensic search of it, and uh, they told me they didn't find anything in it, so that was, you mm -hmm. know, that, was, that story was true, which was... Which was a relief to me. Okay. You know. All right. So we have this car that was specifically bought for her that did not disappear with Susan, despite it being her own car. And eventually he sells it to someone else, I guess, maybe thinking that maybe she's not coming back. Maybe we can look at it uh, a few different ways. Let's just talk about, we really haven't talked about this yet. How much contact... Uh, either when you were with Susan or, if, of course, after, how much contact did you have with Susan's side of the family? I don't mean her ex-husband, but maybe her parents, maybe a sister or brother. Did you have any contact with any of them? No, no, we didn't get along at all. No? Her, um, father, owned a, her, her father owned a bar. It's called the Four Seasons uh, uh, at a place called Rock House. Mm -hmm. And they were just alcoholics. Basically, mm -hmm. and I just, you know, okay. you know, I, I was cordial to them, but as far as uh, associating with them, I just didn't do it. Okay. You know, um, I didn't want Alex. Please. Please. I didn't want Alex exposed to them. Yeah, of course not. Of course not. Okay, so did uh, when you found out this sh these shady stories coming from Larry, uh, it very well may be that she ran off with Manuel or Jose. Just you'd think that Larry would remember the exact name of the guy. But did you or anybody else ever alert Susan's family that she was missing? Do you think Larry did? Did anybody do that? Yeah, well, the FBI did. They questioned them, apparently, mm -hmm. as from what I can understand. But... Uh, you know, I I uh, I uh, got in touch with uh, Brenda Hanks on Facebook, and she said that she hadn't heard from her, you know, mm -hmm. since since they went missing. Who's Who's Brenda? And who's Brenda? That's her sister. Oh, okay, very good. Okay, Brenda Hanks. Okay, thank you. All right, so you did uh, reach out to one of them. Of course, in Facebook, that would have been years after. Facebook didn't come to be a thing until like 2007, 2008. Okay. Yeah. Um, as far as you can tell and realize you are not technically an investigator on all of this, uh, who is the last person who saw Susan and Alex who is believable? Not somebody, somebody you trust. Who is the last person who saw them? Can you? Um, yeah, probably. Well, I've talked to him since. This fellow named Victor Webb, which is her uncle, her first cousin. Mm -hmm. But he said that uh, he told me the same thing about some uh, Hispanic fellas mm -hmm. that that pulled into his service station there, and and I don't I don't know if uh, Victor would lie to me or not. But mm -hmm. of course he was. He's really hard on drugs himself. I mean, he ran his business into the ground because of him. I guess what I'm saying... 
I guess what I'm saying, Rick, is did somebody maybe once again after Alex got taken out of school with this with what we've already talked about, anytime after that, did anybody, once again, some stranger who has no reason to lie, say, you know what, I did see Susan and Alex at the store. I saw them at the movie theater. I saw them there. Did anybody ever come forward to say anything like that? Yeah, well, this guy named Donald Moore told me that he'd seen them uh, over at, uh, what is the name of that place? Over at uh, Pocahontas, Virginia, at a little convenience store there. Hmm. But I never I never followed up on that because, you know, I can't see her you know, down in that, that area. Hmm. Okay. So eventually, uh, I mean, how long did it take for an actual missing persons report to be filed? Of course, it doesn't sound like Larry was going to do anything because I guess to him they aren't missing. They went off with some guy. When was a report filed? Who filed it? When was this done? And what can we say about that? Well, I think that uh, finally, see, I couldn't go to the sheriff's department because the sheriff's involved. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, city policeman, his name was Roger Snow, who liked Alex real well. I mean, he's seen her playing every day. I went over there and I told him the story. And uh, he's the one that uh, entered her in the NCIC and got the kid kidnapping warrant. And uh, then it went to a federal kidnapping warrant. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't even trust the sheriff's department because right. of their involvement. Right. You know. Right. A little so too I close to, watch to who Susan. I talk. Please. I'm sorry. Please. But I could. I had to walk who I talked to because you know I didn't want to. I wanted to keep my cards close to my vest, you know, and just keep my ear to the ground and mm -hmm. see what I could find out. Right. So you didn't trust the sheriff's department, first of all, because the sheriff's a little too friendly with Susan. In addition, you, in your opinion, once we're up there, I'm in, perfectly inclined to believe you, Rick, but you got screwed by them w regarding Alex on that day at school. That's why. That's right. That's right. Okay. And they, even the other ladies there, you know, which I became friendly with, you know how it is when you're picking your children up every day, mm -hmm. you make friends over there. They couldn't believe it, you know. They mm -hmm. just look. They were incredulous. They just didn't know what to make of it, you know. Okay. And I've talked to several of them since then, you know. And they said they just couldn't believe that that had happened. Okay. So what? What city police? Uh, you already named his name, but what city is this uh, that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, Pineville, West Virginia. Okay. And it's the police. It's the same city that the sheriff's uh, office is in. Okay. Now I have to ask, uh, just in case, uh, when this all started getting rolling, Susan is missing, Alex miss is missing, uh, did the police question you about their disappearances? Did they, you know, it, at least for a while, do you think they may have considered you a suspect in the disappearances? No. They never, never. They never even, they never. I went for years that they didn't even, you know, mm -hmm. I, I tried to keep it in the in the mm -hmm. public domain. Yeah. But as far as them ever doing any kind of investigation, never. And they changed, uh, every time I would go to the state police, they'd change the investigators, you know. First mm -hmm. it was Cliff Akers, and then it was this fellow named uh, Johnson or something like that. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, it's just different ones. But Cliff is Cliff Acres, uh, Sergeant Acres is the one who had the biggest file on mm -hmm. Alex. And once again, though, did they ever? Did you when they were when you were talking to any of these people? Did you ever get the feeling that they might have been checking you out just to make sure you didn't do this? Yeah, well, probably. I mean, I would if I was them. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I would uh, for all the bases. Yeah, I mean, you know. Right. Stranger things have happened. Sure, sure. And we'll get to, uh, you've told me about Cliff Acres, and I, I do want to call him. I was going to call him, but we've had this uh, hurricane here down here. I did. You know, he's down in Madeira Beach, which didn't get hit very hard, but he might have uh, had to leave or something for a little while. I, I plan on calling him before this episode comes out just to see if I can reach him. But um, uh, I should ask you this. When... You talk to Larry Webb, he gives you these stories about 
Did you ever have a chance, did you ever go to his house and not confront him, but maybe try to talk to him? You know, they're missing. I mean, this story doesn't sound right. Are you not worried? Did you ever have a face-to-face -face conversation with Larry Webb about all of this? He never would answer the door. Never. And as a matter of fact, me and my daughter stopped by there yesterday and took pictures of the license plates of a vehicle that was sitting there. Mm-hmm. Okay. We went by there yesterday, as a matter of fact. Yeah. But back in 2000, when this is first getting going and you're fearing that your daughter is missing, maybe you don't so much care that Susan is missing, maybe, but you're thinking maybe they're together. And then that, of course, that becomes a concern as well. But you didn't go to Larry Webb's house, you know, knock on the door. You know, Larry, maybe we need to talk about this. I'm worried about my daughter. You know, never did that back then. No, no, because, uh, you know, uh, Randall told me that that would be harassment. Okay. And there was a no contact order. Okay. Let's let's talk about uh, Cliff Akers, who worked for the West Virginia State Police. When did he get involved uh, in this? And do you have any ideas about what he did? Well, I know that he checked their cell phone records, and uh, he had a he had a, a packet of cell phone records just for one month that was like an inch and a half thick, where he had been calling Florida. Mm -hmm. He said most of the most of the uh, calls on that list were to numbers in Florida. You know? uh, so did Cliff go? Uh, once again, I realize you weren't there, but do you believe that this uh, officer with the West Virginia State Police he went and spoke to Larry? Do you know if he asked him about Jose and Manuel? Was Larry able to give them lo full names or anything like that? I don't know. They wouldn't tell me. He said it was a long going investigation and that they they couldn't tell me any specifics. Mm -hmm. I guess because they think, you know, that I go off the deep end and probably try to attack the law into my own hands or something. Okay. But you know, as far as information goes, you know, even the FBI won't tell me anything. You mm -hmm. know, they'll just say, Well, you know, when when we know so when when we when it's resolved, you'll know everything. Okay. Let's, all right, so we have the West Virginia State Police involved. We have the city police involved. Doesn't seem to me, uh, Rick, like they could make heads or tails of it. it. It seems to me like they really didn't know what to do. I'm not saying I'm not conspiratorial or anything, but it doesn't seem like they followed up any leads regarding Jose Manuel or anybody else. No. Okay. No, they don't even have an investigator at the Sheriff's Department. Right. Okay. This is such a small, small rural uh, area mm -hmm. that uh, as far as investigations go, you know, unless it did happen, you know, there's usually mm -hmm. nothing done about it. Uh, you know, I know you've heard about all the missing people around yeah, here. I yeah. have. We've covered at least one of them, Brian Cook, and there, I know there are others. That's true. And we yeah. got some suspicious murders in that area, too. Some guy drowned in his pool. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know, and doesn't look like uh, he he caused his own death. So I I do know about those things. Um, just from a few years yeah. ago, we were concentrating on that. Let's move on to this regard they... regarding the sheriff and being that he knew Susan. Um, did you ever have a chance? Did once again, I know you have pro had problems with him, and you still do have problems with him. I, and we, I think we all totally can understand that. But did he ever offer up any concern? I mean, he's the ones who was who was friends with Susan. Did he not, when you talk to him at least once, say, yeah, you know, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know what happened. What Can you talk about the, the conversations you had with Sheriff Aliff uh, around the time? He just said that she's not missing. I said, well, you know, if she's not missing, where is she? She said, well, she's with her mother. I said, well, where is her mother? And he said, well, I don't know where her mother is, but she's with her. I said, well, you know, it sounds like you're missing to me. You know, if she's not missing, where's she at? Right. And just never could come up with anything, you know. I think it confounded him. Mm -hmm. And do you think, in your opinion, do you think that he was just getting that story from Larry, that Larry said she went to see her mother? Is that what you think or what? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I think they're involved in it together. Okay. All right, so the sheriff's not much help. 
Um, it seems to me that people, as sometimes happens, uh, people start believing stories that maybe 20 years on don't sound very believable, but maybe in the moment, uh, maybe to somebody it seemed believable or they really just didn't want to look into it at all. Uh, but the way you understand it regarding Sheriff Aliff uh, at the time, and we should know that he's retired now, but was he involved in the, uh, the investigation at all, do you believe, or, uh, officially or what? No, he he just never never looked into it, and since then he's been elected to the county commission mm -hmm. by the the crazy people in this county. Elected him to the county commission, okay. who has control of all the county's money now, mm -hmm. which is a, just a money racket in the first place. <laughs> I mean, it, it's crooked from the from the floor up okay. over there. I think we have a new administration, this new fellow that's sheriff, I think he's straight up, but, you know, it's just, it's just so okay. far gone that, that I don't know if it'll ever be straightened out. Okay. Um, so, sheriff, not much help. Maybe not, uh, once again, I, I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories here, but not really officially in charge of the investigation anyway, um, have these other people uh, who are involved, you know, not connected to Larry Webb or to Susan, who seemingly can't make heads or tails of it either. Um, has Larry, to your knowledge, ever expounded on this story regarding Jose and Manuel, saying how Susan even met these guys or this guy or anything else? No. He's never that. And the thing of it is, is uh, the story I got was he had his basement floor to re-cement it like three weeks after they went missing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've tried to have the uh, National Center for, for Missing and Exploited Children to run a GPR over the floor just to see. And uh, the uh, 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 my FBI agent in charge said that since it's been so long that the the bones would probably just be dust anyhow. So it may not even mm. pick them up. It may pick up disturbed ground or something mm. like that. But since last night I've gotten that story about the farm, I know I have probably mentioned it to you and the car hood that, uh, uh, that we're going to go out there and look at later on today. Okay. You let me know how that goes. So maybe well, I certainly can... will. Okay. So are you saying then, uh, your, to your knowledge then, Rick, that Larry Webb's property, if, you know, the story sounds a little shady to me, once again, with my experience, 270 disappearances, that his wife and her child just go off with some guy and he's just like, Psh, oh yeah, it was just some guy and I don't care about the, the, the race or the ethnicity or anything, John Smith, whoever else, and he just doesn't seem to be that, you know, affected by it. Are you saying that his property was never searched? since in the last 22 years not that i know of okay. but i know that that uh, susan's daughter and her dad moved in which mm -hmm. sounds a bit odd it does i agree uh how long did they live there they lived there for years you know until the larry had the dna ran and then he bought him a trailer and moved it to glenn white where they live now they still live together. Have you ever spoken to Chastity and her father, Susan's ex-husband, about any of this? They won't talk to me. Okay. The only time I ever talked to Larry about it, he said, I, I, I think they're dead, don't you? That's what he said to me. Okay. But regarding Chastity, you'd think that they would have a... Or, the, you know, the... the you know, I just think that they might be helpful in some way of living with Larry, but, you know, maybe not. They're living there, obviously. Maybe just It's just, it's very, very crazy, uh, some of these things. But I, I don't doubt you, Rick. I'm not saying uh, to doubt. I don't think, I think the audience should believe every word you're saying. Um, let's move on to this. Uh, just something that I've noticed regarding just like the official news that's out there regarding all of this. And this is a specific question for you. It's on the outline. Why is Natasha's disappearance or Alex's disappearance considered to be in August of 2000, but 
you you can find a well, not officially, but Susan's death certificate was for April of 2000. Any explanation for that? Uh, any insight into that at all? Why you know why the discrepancy there? I have no idea. I mean, uh, you know, Susan was never, as far as I know, she was never declared dead. She didn't have mm-hmm. a death certificate or anything. And Larry worked for the Social Security Administration in Bluefield. Mm. And so the only, I told the state police, I said, it would be a very simple matter to find out who did that. You have to pass for it in to, mm. uh, to input data into the Social Security system. Mm. Uh, whoever did that had to pass for their way in mm. to list her as deceased. Right. I guess what I'm saying is, once again, I, I use some databases uh, for this program that I pay for, and they're not 100% reliable. I would say they're maybe like 93% reliable. But in when you look up Susan, her her information there, it does say that she was declared deceased in April of 2000, and you have no you right. have no explanation for that. No, when uh, one of the databases I use mm-hmm. said that she was. It ceased in 2003. That's so crazy. Okay. And do you know where this, of course, you're saying that, of course, you hadn't seen Alex after January of 2000, but her disappearance is in NamUs and elsewhere. Charlie Project is listed as August of 2000. Do you even know where that date came from? Yes, that's the only time that the, the, I could get the warrant. Oh, okay. It took me that long to get... Wow. Uh, Roger Snow mm-hmm. to file a, the paperwork for a warrant. Okay. And then I think the warrant came out in November. We filed in August and it came out in November. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you for that explanation. So we're kind of clear on why it's August of 2000 for Alex, but we're definitely unclear on why uh, Susan's, uh, we, you know, you have one particular piece of information, I have something different. And, you know, we don't even, we, nobody's seen this death certificate. We don't know if it's in West Virginia, California, or anywhere else, if it even exists. Right? Right. Okay, right. very good. And I guess what you're saying there, if the, the listeners don't understand, is being that Larry worked for the Social Security Administration, I guess what you're saying is you're open to the idea that could he have given Susan and Alex new identities? Uh, of course. Okay. Yeah, I listed Susan as deceased. See, Alex's Social Security number is listed as uh, active mm-hmm. but unused. And Susan's is listed as deceased. Right, 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 exactly. Thank you. That's, that's very clear. Thank you. Um, I'll ask you this. Do you believe, once again, it's been 22 years. Do you believe that... Um, Larry or and Susan's family, given that you wanted to get custody of Alex and seemed like you were well on your way to do that because you were the one who wasn't having as many problems in your life as she was, do you think it's a possibility that their identities were changed to, to hide Alex from you? Well, it could have been, you know, but I, mm-hmm. Alex is intelligent enough mm-hmm. to get a hold of me or my mother. I mean, mm-hmm. she had all the numbers. She knows my brothers and all that. And mm-hmm. the, you know, I, there was one thing I was going to ask you about is uh, if you could run, uh, can you run uh, social security numbers? I, I don't, don't have a I database. Have a de- no, I have no idea. I have no power to do that with social security numbers. That's a, that's a government thing. I don't think anybody can do that in the private sector. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, I was going to be Alex's social security number, but if you can't use yeah, it, then it's no. I know, I, I think that would be, I, that would, if the public had access to those, I don't know what kind of fraud would be having all over the place. We have enough as it is, but uh, I don't think so. All I can do is run people's names to try to find uh, email addresses, phone numbers, ad, uh, addresses, right. and things like that. But, like, been, been verified or people yeah. search or something. Right, right, um, yes. All right, so we have all, all of this, all of this going on, and in your opinion, since 2000, would you say that the entire case has been pretty cold? 
Yes, it's been cold until just recently when the FBI has reopened it, and uh, yeah. they're calling it a brand new case, like it just happened yesterday. Right. Now, the way you understand it, how did this uh, all come about that, uh, you know, they're, they're reopening this? In fact, there was just a huge press conference within the last couple weeks. How did that all come together, your understanding of it, Rick? Well, they told me that uh, they had been watching and that uh, a new, a new uh, uh, team had come on and they were looking into the cold cases that uh, had been cold for a while and that Alex's name popped up right off the bat and that mm -hmm. they were going to... They were going to reopen it, and it's no longer a cold case. It's an open investigation. Okay. So this was, uh, this like came out of nowhere to you? It was like there was nothing, then all of a sudden they're telling you they're doing something? Is that how it worked? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. That had it to shocked me. I'm sure it did. That had to have made your day. Oh, uh, yes. I mean, I, the tears, I mean, I couldn't contain myself. I bet. You know, asked me to say a few words, and and I, you know, it was such a shock that I, you know, I just couldn't hardly hold back. You know, right. after twenty years, they're finally someone's going to pay attention and and try to find my baby, and bring her home, no matter what. I told them I want to bring her home. Yeah. You know where she's loved, and you know. Not, mm. not somewhere, well, yeah. I, I, there are certain places I won't allow my mind to go, you know. Yeah. Right. You know. Uh, I have to ask. Now, obviously, these are law enforcement people who are going to be doing this, but as the listeners have heard, you have been very critical of the law enforcement, not taking it seriously at the time. Of course, the sheriff at the time you know, having a conflict of interest at the very least, if not something worse than that. Have you told the investigators here in 2022 about all of that? Are they aware of everything that you went through regarding law enforcement in 2000? Yes. Oh, yes. You know, I'll mm -hmm. tell him, but it wants to listen. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. I mean, if Randall Adel came here, I'd tell him exactly what I, well, I put it on Facebook. Yeah, I know. Name, name. I, I know you. I know I've seen. But I guess what I'm saying is they do realize that, in a way, once again, we don't want to get into theories there, but you suspect that there are people who know what happened, who are in a law enforcement capacity that know exactly what happened. Do, have you told law enforcement that? Yes, okay. yes. And they know. Okay. You know, the FBI, I don't want to let anything out, but I mean, you know, they're, they're looking into it. Okay, very good. Certain. Um, if you can say, if you feel at the liberty to say, but, um, I, maybe I should ask you this first. What technically, what law enforcement, uh, departments are now involved with this new press conference? What different law enforcement, uh, uh, departments were involved in this press conference? All right. All right. That's the FBI, the Department of Justice, the, uh, U.S. Marshals, uh, West Virginia State Police, the Beckley City Police, and the Prosecutor's Office of uh, Raleigh County, mm -hmm. and the Raleigh County Sheriff's Office. Is this Raleigh Just, County the same one that where Sheriff Ailiff was? No, it's Wyoming County. Okay. It's, they're side by side. Right. Right. Um, of course, Sheriff Ailiff, I understand, is uh, retired now. Have you ever spoken to the new sheriff? Uh, who took his place, or maybe there's been a couple since then. Have you ever ta talked to that person about all this? No, I've talked to him before, but I haven't talked to him lately. But you've mm. given me a great idea. I think I will <laughs> go over there and have, well, a, have a word or two with <laughs> Happy to help, Rick. Happy to help. All right, so you got all these um, different uh, law enforcement agencies. They seem um, somewhat objective in all of this, uh, you know, kind of, no, seemingly having no connection to Sheriff Aliff or to Larry Webb, or which might have complicated things the first time around, or you know, since it's been like this for twenty years. But have the police, in talking to them, if you can say, have they ever offered not your theory regarding what happened, but have they ever offered up their own theory? Can you tell about what they're going to be doing? 
does it lead you to believe what they think happened back in 2000? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, about, uh, uh, I guess it's been four weeks ago, they came and did my DNA test up there. Okay. Uh, the FBI took my DNA, mm -hmm. and I asked them why, and they said, well, it's just something they were looking into, so I don't mm -hmm. know. Right. I thought maybe they'd found something through NamUs or something, okay. you know. All right, so I guess what you're saying is you really, they knew, you know that they're doing something right now, but you don't know exactly what it is. Right. And okay. see, they don't give me any information yeah. because it's ongoing investigation. Right. Would you, would you say that uh, compared to 2000, that your interactions with law enforcement today have been better than back in 2000? Well, they're 100% better. Okay, good. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Excellent. And I love it when some case that you think is totally cold, just, you know, somebody calls you up and says, hey, want you to know we're going to be looking at this again. Once again, that just had to have made your, yeah, I'm sure it's many prayers answered. Yeah. Well, you know, when they found uh, Samantha Smart, right. I just about lost hope, you know, and then they found her alive. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I mean, it's shown a whole new light on the whole situation that perhaps, maybe, she, she could be alive somewhere. Right. Of course. Uh, I guess you know about the Samantha I, Smart. I certainly, I certainly do. I certainly do. And I'm sure the audience does as well, certainly. Describe the last 22 years, uh, Rick. Uh, you know, here you were fighting for custody, which seems to me to seem to be the right thing to do, given how Susan was. And then it seems to me, once again, my perception is that you were right on the verge of getting custody of your daughter, and then she and her mother go missing. Uh, describe the last 22 years and having to live with something like that. Uh, it's just... It's the closest thing to hell on earth that anybody could ever imagine. Yeah. I mean, every day, I have like a shrine set up on my room. If you could just see it, just uh, every picture that I ever had of Alex. Yeah. It's just on my, on my mirror. I mean, you know, I just, I look at him every day and I speak to him and, you know, just mm -hmm. like she's here. I mean, maybe in, in another in another realm or something she can hear me or whatever. Right. Sure. Sure. So, um, mm -hmm. It's just nobody knows unless they've been really been through it. It's the not knowing. Yeah. You know, if you know, if a child gets killed in a car wreck, you mourn and you, you bury that child and you grieve and you go on. But when they just come up and disappear you never have a chance to to know i mean it's every day there's no kind of no kind of closure or anything you know you live with it and all things all manner of horrible things run through your mind of what could have happened you know she could have been trafficked or right. or tortured or, right. you know, i just I just don't even want to go there. I mean, right. that's one of the places I won't let my mind yeah. go. Yeah, of course, of course. Rick, uh, I know you have uh, you are very active on social media, as both my assistant, uh, myself, and my assistant Emily uh, have noticed. Uh, of course, over the last four or five years, um, why don't you give out? Um, you know, your personal Facebook page. I know you have a new, maybe a new page. The uh, I friended you just today. But you have a Facebook page uh, for uh, Alex's disappearance. Why don't you tell the listeners all about all of that right now? All right. Well, it's Ricky Lafferty on Facebook. And then uh, my personal email is Ricky Lafferty uh, 19 at Gmail. Mm -hmm. And uh, any information anyone has, no matter how small or insignificant you think that, that it is, it may be that piece of the puzzle that brings everything together and brings my baby home. And what is uh, the Facebook page that you run for this disappearance, your daughter's disappearance? 
Well, I just run, I just run my my page. Oh, okay. You just run your page. Okay, very good. Yeah. And I uh, want you give the email out uh, again, once again, because we had a little hiccup in the communication. They're a little fuzzy there. Why don't you give your email address out one more time, Rick? All right, it's R I C K Y L A F F T Y nineteen at gmail dot com. All right, Ricky Lafferty nineteen at gmail dot com. Yes. Okay, very good. Rick, any final words before we complete this interview? Well, I just appreciate you, Edward. I mean, anything, any exposure that we can bring mm -hmm. to maybe jog people's memories or, or their conscience to bring Alex home to a family who misses her and loves her every day of this world. Her, her, her grandmother is 90 years old this mm -hmm. month, and uh, she prays every day that, that we'll, we'll find out what happened to Alex, you know, before, you know, the inevitable mm -hmm. on that end happens. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Emma, her, her half-sister, she just, she, she thinks of her as a sister. She, when she talks about Alex, she talks about her sister, not her half sister. Mm -hmm. and we just, we want her home, one way or another. We want her home. I don't care. If she's the worst jockey in the world. We'll deal with that bridge when we cross it. Mm -hmm. But we want her home. Rick, thank you for appearing on this episode of Unfound. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dental. I appreciate the opportunity to get Alex's story out. You're welcome. And that was my October 1st, 2022 interview with Rick Lafferty, father of Natasha, Alex Carter, and ex-boyfriend of Susan Carter. I thank him for appearing on this episode. I was not able to do a video interview with him for all of you YouTube people due to him never using Zoom before. In fact, Rick does not even own a cell phone. As you heard during my talk with Rick, he and I have known each other for a while. And I have to admit that I was so green when we first talked that what Rick told me back in 2017 into 2018 seemed exaggerated and a bit outlandish. Now, 200-some disappearances later, par for the course, pretty much. We've heard a lot of Larry Webb types of stories, ones in which people who should care about the missing person or persons don't seem to be bothered at all. We've heard a lot about law enforcement officers whose attitudes toward disappearances are at best flippant, at worst criminal. We've heard a lot about people with mental issues who act unpredictably from day to day. And certainly, cheating has been a part of many unfound episodes. Yep, all of it. Now, common. We've come a long way, baby. Having said all that, here's what I think is on your mind right now. You can certainly believe that Larry or someone did something to Susan. Not saying she deserved it. Absolutely not. But she was a loose cannon. She got around. She certainly loved male attention. In the heat of the moment, anything is possible. But what happened to Natasha? Well, the problem is that Susan, at least the way Rick explained her, and yes, I understand he is the ex-boyfriend, we can't rule out that Susan really did take Natasha, and they ran off with some one-name guy. And Larry's indifference has everything to do with him looking at it as a blessing in disguise. Yes, maybe a stretch, but it wouldn't be a first. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. Right now, while you are in your podcast platform, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, 
Give Unfound a five-star review, a thumbs up, whatever that platform allows. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Densel, and you've just finished this episode of Unfound.